Hello everyone, today we talk about the medieval Christian canon collections and digging a bit in the beginnings uh, of such juridical development and uh, the story behind the development of the Christian canons, so the rules through which the church uh, administered itself. And since the early times the church had matured a clear conception of the juridical system, according to which law was essentially divided in jus divinum and jus humanum. Uh, this distinction was stemming from the uh, realization that the world, the seculum, was somewhat separated from the uh, spiritual dimension, and so the essentially inserting also in juridical culture such dichotomy, differentiating but still maintaining as a double thread in parallel the freedom of conscience and the one of cult in practice. And uh, the church was spreading, by the way, in the most advanced uh, juridical uh, system in, in Western Eurasia, that is, the, the one of the Roman Empire was dramatically developed and sophisticated, uh, but at the same time, not quite in the, again, uh, absolutistic way that we, we think of law today, not even by the standards that the um, the, the the empire would have adopted with the Codex Theodosianus and even more with the Corpus Juris uh, Civilis, as essentially the the early Roman law was pretty much like a in fact was a common law, right? It had developed like the other um, Central European tribal systems, eventually you know together with Roman civilization developing, being written down, expanded, but it was quite composite. Right, it included a great deal of autonomies that actually by late Roman times in terms of individual liberties were even, even greater than before, which was a much more Spartan, brutal world, uh, as you know, but that's where the same, the same law had developed. So, use divinum, use humanum, divine law and human law. The first was articulated in positive divine law, the use divine constitutionis, and in the natural law. The sources of positive divine law are constituted, uh, predictably enough, by the Holy Scriptures, but from one side, and by tradition, however, from the other. The latter composed both by the traditio divina, that is to say the precepts transmitted directly by Jesus to the Apostles, and the Traditio Humana, that comprehends uh, in turn the Traditio Apostolica, so deriving from the teaching of the Apostles, and the Traditio Ecclesiastica, formulated by the authority of the same Church. Mm. Natural law was constituted then by the natural order of things, that is to say, the order that God had conferred to creation. Right? This was an important connection with, with the concept of common law as well, and as we have seen elsewhere. And in fact, the human law as such uh, uh, consisted in the norms that disciplined the intersubjective relations, that is, the secular human law, um, and um, also within the rules that the Church gave herself for its own order, the ecclesiastical human law, right, that depended on the local ecclesiastic communities, etc., with a degree of autonomy. And uh, divine law and human law had to constitute an harmonious unity, as you understand, because they had the, the latter to strive towards the first in a in in a single direction in a hierarchical fashion um, so that the human law specifically as expression of the also tran transient needs of the communities didn't have to detach itself from the first it was eternal immutable as direct manifestation of of God's will, right? So, of course, the imperfection of the world, the original sin, would make 
as you know, uh, justice actually not being of this world, but humans always being provided with free will and therefore being able to recognize the truth, at least as a direction, uh, and to act accordingly and therefore, you know, with all the various degrees of imperfection, still trying to make a difference in a world without justice by, by making justice. Um, and because of this reason, the church declared herself as natural title holder of the uh, ad probatio consuetudinis power, that is to say, the authority of evaluating the correspondence or the respondence, better, um, to divine law of the customs that had matured within the communities of the faithful and to impose the abrogation of the same in the case that such evaluation had resulted uh, negatively, right? So the idea is that if you are a community of Christians and the church finds in your behavior something that doesn't quite work, the faculty of the ad probatio consuetudine, so the, the ad pr approval of the customs, would have to, you know, to decide what, what to do about this and to fix what didn't work and also to keep improving what can always be improved, again, because of the, af the aforementioned uh, uh, doomed nature of, of mankind, right? If we just leave it alone without, without God and, and, and salvation. So um, this conception of divine redemption and salvation and this dominating aspect of salvation um, was the idea through which salvation was not a, a merely individual fact. Right? But on the contrary, of course, it's a collective one. It belonged to the church. You cannot be saved without the Holy Ghost within the communion. So the single faithful was saved only uh, if the entire community in which, to which it belonged could uh, aspire in virtue of its complex behaviors to the uh, granting of salvation. So when it came to secular communities that were not the church but naturally its members were part of the church uh, being part of, of a sinful community equated by some degree of course of being responsible for that sin which is actually a very deep and civic and intelligent civilizational principle that already existed actually in in the in the pagan world um, that's the same reason why the romans forced um, everyone to make the symbolic act of cult to the um, to the empire that was the the absolute divine power so that you could believe not really everything right there were superstitions that were illegal just like during the middle ages um, witchcraft was illegal but again there was a complete continuity right all peoples all cultures uh, had this kind of uh, right to discrimination, by the way, because these were antisocial cults, were very often of communistic m matrix, were pretty fringe, and so these were always repressed. The, the myth that you know the church arrived and began to repress um, in in a world that tolerated everything is probably one of the most stupid things that liberal historiography came up with. I mean, it's the complete ignorance of the entire history of religion, for that matter, with pagan cultures. And but unfortunately, this is again very common. Right. There are people who actually believe this, that in the ancient world there was free tolerance for everyone. This is complete insanity. Study history of religion, study Roman law, study uh, cultural practices in the, among the Germans, study uh, basically anything you can find. You can, you're not free at all, first of all. There is no such thing like freedom of conscience, because by the way, um, and, and that's what also the Christians introduced in practice, because... Um, the idea is that if just one person doesn't carry out the sacrifice, and so if the uh, community is not unitary, you're out, right? You cannot belong to that, right? You doom the entire community, and as such, 
um, you you're lost. Right. So in, in Christianity, that in a certain sense um, separated further the divide between freedom of conscience and freedom of cult. And so um, having a church that was actually separated from the state. That's yet another concept that people say, oh, you know, believe finally uh, after, you know, the 17th, the, the 18th century in, in a world where the church is separated from the state. Well, actually, if we are, we, we are to be correct historically, the church has always been separated from the state. Right? In fact, that the church was made up, uh, that, that, a, that a state was made up by Christians that also followed the church had nothing to do with uh, any union of the church and the state. What you're talking about is actually a pagan reality where um, essentially there, there was a, 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 let's say a, a superior, o omnipowerful entity that um, at that point you were ruled through um, your own action by, um, in, in a way that you couldn't quite be uh, detached from also civilly. Right, as we were saying before, like also priests in pagan tribes, etc. You you couldn't really do whatever you wanted, right? If you didn't uh, obey, you were out, right? And this is also part of the reason of the difference between the zip and the comitatus, because the individuals of the comitatus believed that they could become, let's say, uh, they could achieve salvation by themselves, um, whereas the zip was still kind of regulated by this higher D divided form of you know of class of priesthood thinking about the druids or or others there are differences but essentially these this more civilized world kind of um, from which eventually tribes evolved into something more than tribes it is kind of more resemblant to in fact the kind of Christian uh, ecclesiastical model that eventually spread in those cultures when they were Christianized but that w was already present in the uh, diminishment of the uh, of the divine way of the comitatus, right, uh, compared to that. And so this divide is actually crucial to um, to assess because very often you have no idea how much, even just we see it here from medieval law, but, you know, how much this all is ignored, right? Here you ignore not just history per se, but properly the meaning of medieval law, the meaning of ancient law and medieval religion and ancient religion and we don't, uh, we still live again in a, in a statistic collectivistic world after the, uh, after the 19th century uh, that brought in nationalism, socialism, and so the idea that uh, whatever is fundamentally opposed to that model does not quite deserve to exist. So that it's better to pretend, I don't know, that the pagan world was actually an atheistic world. Uh, as long as you can hate, for example, Christianity, not understanding that that, that was just overlapping with the, uh, with the universal idea of the time. These mistakes are done all the time because all most of what this, you know, th this cultural ideologies wanted to inject successfully in our culture is the elimination of every form, any trace of sacred. Uh, and so the, uh, the shift of... Uh, you know, human ambition towards the, the truth, the infinite, the absolute, and not towards a contingental set of... In fact, man-made rules that do not actually look morally and scientifically at the always better that you can be, which is, again, well, what traditional cultures, a pagan or theistic alike, uh, but... Even there, the difference does, especially monotheism, polytheism, do, do not quite exist, never quite exist. It was the same, again, uh, concept evolving different exterior features, but the, the form still being, besides also the substance, the, the same and the only possible one, by the way. Now, uh, as a consequence of all this, it's obvious that you had a... You know, what was the point of also the church having such um, power on these communities? Well, well, of course, it was to make, given that they were, again, the same communities, right? Because the official region of the state was Christianity, but again, the church was not the state, right? So the point was to make the state function well, right? It was essentially realizing that there was a, a sacred that... Uh, the the secular world had to conform to if it wanted to 
get saved uh, in, in the first place, right? And today we do not digress exactly on the importance that the uh, also the independence of the church had in this process, especially in the difference between the Western and Eastern Christianity, because um, the uh, say orthodoxy tended to fundamentally to to sclerotize this connection, right? The the Constantinople Latin Church just obeyed to the emperor that could put to death patriarchs, uh, popes, if he managed to reach them in the West, uh, etc. And essentially just not having any moral countering, right? Uh, even if the papacy was just definitely a pain in the behind for, for the secular authority in the West, still the secular authority developed dramatically and with a much deeper sense of itself. And the same goes for the church, for, the, for this dichotomy, to make the West developing in a unique and different way for which we can literally afford to say that church and state were also de facto separated, uh, besides formally, right? And don't think the concept is, um, is easy, right? That's why we make lots of videos about the investiture struggles, because again, uh, this would have been the, the apparent normality uh, had um, the uh, say the the idea of, of a of a Christian empire of essentially ecumenic nature having had to encompass the entirety of, of the church as it was since the the beginning of the um, you know the, the Christianization of of, uh, of the empire that, that is the secular acceptance of the the adoption of Christianity as the official religion. But the way this had to happen again on a on a on a also de facto secular level, it contained lots of issues regarding the relation and the influence with the same church, right? That the Westerners didn't take lightly, and of course also because the Latin Germanic um, uh, political and institutional systems were uh, a bit slower. To develop, but still exactly because of this constant definition of the respective sphere of influences w within the same field of cooperation, right? That overlap because again, it, it's different. It's what pertains to the heavens, what pertains to the earth, um, it what pertains to the spirit, and what pertains to the matter. And you cannot simply okay make them fully overlap. There, there is something within the same concepts of these two dimensions uh, that uh, cannot be equated by definition. And that's again why the church was not part even of the empire in the West historically. I mean, th just think about this, it, it's crucial. Um, so the um, it was not part of the state literally. I mean to considering properly the, even the, the church possession so the church, by the way, affirmed its exclusive competence both in the discipline of the clergy and in their uh, appointment. This was called the intuito persone. Um, and in some matters of secular human law, that is intuito materie, that is ex exactly the, the difference that stood between the two the two communities the lay and the ecclesiastical one now the discipline of such sectors pertained from one side to customs uh, from the other to the church legislation first of all the co uh, conciliar one the councils were as it's known the assemblies of bishops and they uh, are distinguished in reason of the, the jurisdictional width of uh, of the same that can be recognized as um, ecumenical, wh that is when the bishops of the entire Christendom participate and during which uh, some matters in uh, some decisions, matters of faith and, di and temporal discipline are valid for the entire community of the faithful. And local or provincial that is uh, attended by bishops of 
of one or more provinces and the deliberations of which have to do in particular uh, with the represented communities. Hence also the uh, hierarchical issues because before the Gregorian reforms it was not really a head of the church despite Rome was always recognized the primacy um, spiritually but this was not meant administratively to to affect this um, you know the, the, the autonomy of the bar the deliberations and this created enormous uh, problems because uh, lack of authorities always causes problems and um, the um, especially during the early Middle Ages so at the moment of greater uh, a greater separation of the various ecclesiastical sees the uh, ecclesiastical customs of various regions could be very different right and not only that but also and this is a huge problem historically and ecclesiologically um, the uh, the collections of the same canons of the deliberations of the ecumenic councils that is to say would did actually record what was deliberated in the ecumenic council if there was not really a head in the church right every um, participant could essentially have they probably had uh, some retinues of scribes etc that noted what was deliberated but they once they came home they also could alter this content or would be altered uh, over time uh, mostly for political reasons, right, reasons of like, local ecclesiastical policy, or also broader ones at the time, but also because maybe they, they literally didn't preserve the recordings accurately or they, they made mistakes while copying them. This was a huge problem. That's the same reason why the filioque issue, for example, came uh, to be, because of a simple mis mistranslation from Greek into Latin. Um, so these were huge problems in ecclesiastical history and that's why the canon collections were also so crucial since uh, the decisions and and they since the beginning and, and such decisions were uh, to be preserved quite carefully and within an ideology that uh, could preserve such same order uh, in fact the council's decisions were designated with the term of canons from canon uh, in Greek so meaning measure and thus rule term from which the attribute of canonic uh, derives uh, which uh, is attributed to the entire human law of the church in the process through the progressive emergence of the universal authority of the Roman Pope eventually uh, to the conciliar decisions were added as sources of canonic law the decisions of the orders transmitted by the Pope to the entire community of faithful that is decisions and orders that were designated with different terms we already made videos about this um, constituciones edicta rescripta decreta and especially the uh, epistle or the more um, famously known litere decretales as with this, der this term or more in fact more simply the uh, decretales that were of huge importance especially as additions after the decretum graziani about which we made uh, a video I don't think about the, the decretum in itself but at least the later um, the reception of the decretum in the following uh, addition especially in the late middle ages were important as the church was structuring as properly as a state with a, a monarchy actually with a bureaucracy that was the most advanced one together with the French um, uh, monarchies one uh, and that in fact also had a great a great deal of mutual um, you know influence given that uh, remember this that canon law was developing in parallel with um, civil law right the imperial laws and more in general the uh, the laws of the uh, of the lay communities right so there is a civilizational parallel 
in the development of these two laws. Just think about, I, I mean, the, the investor struggle and so the development of uh, more sound collections with the decretum, the, from one side the recovery of Roman law from the other and so on. So the primary object of the conciliar decisions were naturally the matters of faith were discussed, theologically the interpretation of the texts of the revelation and of tradition and it's, it, it's in fact famous about this that in the first centuries uh, the uh, Eastern Church committed itself especially in the definition of the nature of Christ. The Ecumenic Council of Ephesus in 431 condemned the uh, monophysic doctrine that recognized the sole uh, divine nature of Christ and the following Council of Chalcedon in 451 reaffirmed the union within the person of Christ of the two natures um, the human, the divine one, while the Western Church instead occupied itself in particular of the theme of, uh, of, the theme of salvation, right? Condemning the doctrine of the monk Pelagius that attributed salvation to, to the only works of the faithful and not to the intervention of divine grace. The Pelagian doctrine was deliberated by the Council of Ephesus of 431 and reaffirmed by the one of Orange in 529. You see this kind of more Western shift that is in great part also at the base of the... Of course, this, the idea that, of course, you need a medium in order to save yourself was already there in Christianity, also in the political example of other... Uh, of leadership in, the, in paganism. Um, but uh, it entails properly the problem here that would be at, at, at the center of the same investor struggle that is, um, do, you know, do, do we have to be without any form of regulation? Do, do we have to challenge ourselves constantly right, to, to say who are, you know, who is anyone to, to presume they can save themselves by themselves, right? Unless they actually demonstrate they can do, which is uh, still a po an open possibility. Right, Christ succeeded, and that's why you know Christianity was born. Aside, well, okay, was born because of Saint Paul rather than Jesus, but uh, in a way, the civilization. In that, but the the question is, is is a deeply serious one, and it was already present uh, in a way in the past. So even about this, the Church was conferring an important amount of uh, of power to the same. Um, you know the, the same debate about the the possibility of saving uh, oneself uh, and how, but never giving anyone the uh, just the you know the easy impression that it can be done uh, without and without also the same church. So without, as in the past, uh, an authority that could that had to safeguard certain moral standards through the, the, the same existence of the institution, by the way, because, you know, as you know, that this was, of course, people today are, do not even reason in the level of complexity people reason at the time, mostly. They just have either a, a pro or against kind of church um, position in a, in, a, in a volley lay sense, right? You know, uh, I hardly met... Uh, anyone in my life who actually understands this this point the, not the banal concept in itself that of course the the office and the person are two different things but how this factually declines in practice and so to, to have also a, a consistent historical explanation of the history of the church etc but what I mean talking about I mean I see it from everywhere that nobody cares about these topics because um, it's, it's just you know, I say it all the time. Look at the stats of my videos and which ones are more watched and, and uh, less um, less uh, and, and which one are less. So, and to the theological questions were added the examination of juridical problems in the sense under both profiles. The one we just said, the secular one, also for the church, because as you know, there is a secular clergy that lives in the world uh, and that has to cope with problems of the world uh, and the 
the spiritual ones. Um, and so, of both the administration of the church and the discipline of the subjects that were reserved to her. Right? And the same consideration can be made relatively to the papal interventions. And it follows from this that the canon collections um, that were mostly enriched by the papal decretals, elaborated during the uh, early Middle Ages, reunited the entire uh, group, the entire ensemble of decisions without distinguishing between theological and juridical matter. And such collections spread in the Christian world since the 5th century were needed, right? As we were saying before, the, yeah, there was a, a, an important separation, especially up to the Carolingian times, of this various um, areas of Europe, administratively, linguistically, and so on. But uh, this, uh, these collections were still needed. They circulated, which shows that uh, the same ecclesiastical administration needed them right, to confront the various... Uh, interpretation from various authorities, various uh, bishops, councils, etc. Um, they can't, um, we can uh, remind, for example, the Versio Antiqua Romana, so the ancient Roman version of the canons of the Nicaea Council 325, uh, that would eventually be called uh, Vetus Romana when it was integrated by the canons of the councils of Sardica. In 343, and the collectio or versio Isidoria Isidoriana or Hispana that was um, erroneously attributed to Isidore of Sevilla, as you know, the great Visigothic scholar, uh, Romano Visigothic scholar of the end of the, the, um, the sixth, the beginning of the seventh century, hence Isidoriana, or rather Hispana. It was however, composed probably instead in Italy during the 5th century. And between the end of this century and the beginning of the following one, a monk named um, Dion Dionysus composed, two, uh, composed in Rome two collections. One including the Latin text of 50 pseudo apostolic canons of uh, and of canons approved in the most meaningful Eastern councils, both ecumenic and Eastern ones, given that uh, the majority, uh, if anything, of ecumenic activity was was in, was in the East, right? The, uh, also, the, the church was kind of more organized uh, by a certain degree there. And still, it was the sea of, of the Roman Empire, so the church maintained important connections with it during early medieval times, because it was not yet fully understood what the, the future of that empire would be before the emergence of the Western one. Um, and the other one is of papal decretals issued between the end of the 4th century and the end of the following one. The two collections were eventually reunited in the so-called Collectio Dionysiana, also known as Codex or Corpus Can Canonum. Um, and um, a, a drafting of such collection, widened uh, compared to the original, was sent in 774 by Pope Hadrian I to Charlemagne. And in 802 it was approved by the the Diet of Aachen as the collection of the f f uh, of the law, the Frankish Church, that took thus the name of Collectio Dionysio Adriana. So basically, these canon collections were essentially sent in the Frankish Empire to reform the local church according to this previous uh, historical um, collection that had been properly used by the popes, written in Rome, uh, and co containing all these various um, and this canons uh, of the most important ecumenic and provincial councils, also of you know, Roman 
uh, probably also Byzantine at that point origin, which is quite meaningful because um, it's it, it say it, this is not the time when the investor struggles, but still the idea that the Roman law had to be at the base, after all, even though what we're talking about an ecclesiastical one, so an, not a secular law. Um, had to be, however, at the base of the restructuring of the of the Western Empire, right? For the uh, Frankish Roman Emperor to, in fact, adopt it to reform the the Transalpine Church is is quite meaningful administratively, and we know how we've seen it many times how important the uh, the the Carolingian Church was in the imperial project and how essentially the greatest civilizational accomplishment of the Carolingian Empire passed through such ecclesiastical reform and all its consequences, the, the, the monastic spread, the, the, even the, the script unif uniformation, and more. Because this had been the state of the Franks that previously didn't even concretely have one. Uh, in, the, in the attempt at that point to, to maintain this, this, this empire on something more solid, Right, that at least, in fact, survived the same empire, or at least the Frankish one. Uh, in the 6th and 7th centuries, furthermore, many provincial churches carried on with the drafting of canon collections. This is the case, for example, of the African church, to which is owed the brevi uh, Breviatio Canonum of the mid-6th century, in Justinian times, and the Concordia Canonum at the end of the, of the same century, uh, and also the Spanish church that drafted a, a collection designated as Hispanica, or still as, um, as is, like in the previous example, as Isidoriana, because this was also erroneously attributed to Isidore of Seville. But um, these two provinces are not random, because um, they were part of the Byzantine reconquested territory. Right, uh, and so you realize that uh, they they were part of a broader project of reform that fit the imperial Byzantine imperial project, right, of universal reunification. And Rome, as we've seen, had also more stably remained within uh, this um, this center, right, and such um, with a greater continuity. After all, the I mean, both Africa and Spain would be taken over by by the Arabs later on. But even in the case of, let's say, Carthage was an important ecclesiastical center. Also, um, in southern southern Iberian Peninsula, uh, Sevilla was, and the Visigoths ruled there. But it was rather the the uh, Toledo councils that uh, represented the Visigothic production. Was this in the south, you see that there is a strong Roman influence that we were talking about the other day also during the um, in that video about how the Romans chose to be Germans uh, etc. Um, there were also other local churches drafts um, such as the Libri Penitentialis that contained the list of sins with relative penance that is quite interesting because it also was influenced by Germanic law in this kind of more kind of primitive list, right? So the legal code devoid of kind of, um, uh, of like complex refined uh, categories, institutions, uh, you know, the, the Corpus Juris Civilis was, was, was a masterpiece in juridical science. This was just, you know, lists say you do this, you get punished like that. This reflects their, their simpler uh, cultures that were, however, you know, also, as you know, the Byzantine Empire would undergo an important decline at some point, so were somewhat adapting to certain realities, especially in the, in fact, at least Romanized areas, because otherwise the, the were important, uh, the, the were important continuities, as we've just seen with the, uh, with the production of canon collections by the in, in the, the areas that would remain also more literate, more active, um, 
as communities, economically, socially, etc. In any case, uh, starting from the 9th century, so at the end of this period, that so a stasis of, of, overall, the same uh, Roman law, uh, I mean, the, the same Byzantine law was forgotten in many ways. The Romans in other countries sometimes, there is a huge debate relatively how much the the Corpus Juris Civilis was received in other areas because we know that somewhere circulated but not that it was applied or anything like the same Romans that inhabited areas like I don't know um, the decentralized Byzantine areas in Italy we know, we know they had um, just a, a, a Roman custom law right they that had grown fundamentally autonomous about, and about which we don't even know that much because at that point it was the Germanic law issued uh, also with a big deal of romanization by the southwestern European regions right and starting from the 9th century said the in the uh, western world began to circulate collections that reunited the originary texts of canons and of decretals together with uh, others that were modified and also some false documents for the aforementioned reasons but somebody had wanted to define certain uh, rules or privileges or things and the most responsible of these, this type of collection was especially the Frankish church uh, before the Roman reform um, and um, this was um, due to properly the, their political culture I mean they were intention to use this important use the monopoly of, 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 of the script of writing in, in northern Gaul were generally speaking the societies as you know was much more vertical right with a few real elite the all the others kind of under and illiterate etc to in fact build also the juridical foundation of its claims towards the lay authorities with which they were um, in constant dialect because the, the church had an enormous power that had kept, I mean, the Gallic church properly, um, that uh, had grown disproportionately, especially the decline of Merovingian power, so that the Carolingians at some point kind of began to reduce it significantly, and or at least to to take it over, to retake the reins of, of the church as they had, um, excuse me, drink a little, Their, I mean, the sa their same per predecessors had um, fundamentally always tried to do. I mean, that's what the Merovingian Empire existed in the first place. Um, we had an alliance with the, with the church, right? And so, using this um, Refor Roman Reformation with papal support, the same Gallic Church, and especially in the fringe areas. I mean, not even specifically the ones of. Um, of northern Gaul in particular, I mean there was a big deal of that there, but even more in, in actually in central southern France, right, the ones that were more peripheral to the St. Frankish power, had uh, needed this broader uh, reform and had autonomized themselves to a point, some point of non-recognition, was, was, um, was a, a very serious issue and another major um, civilizational in expansion and impact of of the uh, of the uh, Western Roman uh, imperial axis guided by the Franks in Rome, and this um, uh, is also what we were talking about the other day in that video about that that leftistic article that we debunked. In people said, you know, that the church had kind of given ground. Like, the church had expanded dramatically in this time, especially in Gaul and Frankish areas, and their needs of reform and uh, broader fitness of even the, the Anglo Saxon mission were, you know, meant to be a model, an example that the same court could vacillate to make the rest of the church also increasing the standards of its own. Um, it's not it's moral standards fundamentally because these people were not even just as we would think abbots or bishops they were simply somebody who had covered the office and lived as a normal lay nobleman right that was the issue of the Frankish church most um, in any case uh, object of the al the aforementioned alteration 
of the content and of the, the, the default, the fakes that were comprehended within these collections that were in fact known as Frankish falsifications were both the mm, canon law sources and the secular ones such as imperial Roman imperial constitutions and even the same Frankish capitulars right this was this shows you exactly how much the church how powerful the Gallic church had already become by that point and how the again the Carolingians and the papacy brought them down by also restoring an important amount of both Roman and Frankish um, secular law in the process so, uh, which again for, in terms again of, of civilizational balance and struggle it it's a, a very meaningful that the papacy supported this as well to strengthen the same Frankish imperial power uh, accordingly and among such collections we can remember for example the one titled as Decretales Pseudo Isidoriane and the other one indicated as the capitularies of Benedict Levitt and the circulation of this type of collections is witnessed not only by the numerous manuscripts that arrive to us but also by their frequent use from by uh, by following sources right later sources such as the Collectio Canonum Anselmo Dedicata right in the first half of the 10th century the Benedictine monks of Cluny in southern France under the guidance of the abbot Odo formulated as you know their own program of ecclesiastical reform that was founded on the um, potestas of the ad probatio consuetudinis denouncing the uh, firmly uh, widespread and um, praxis let's say within the European continent for which the ecclesiastical beneficia in particular the ones of the regular clergy had ended up to be um, subjugated to the dominium of lay lords and uh, this uh, reform as you know demanded the restoration on of, of, of the same canon norms that reserved to the clergy only the choice of the abbatial dignities and condemned any form of simon and this as you know is properly the the germ of the um, the same uh, church reformation and the Gregorian ones especially and it was met with favor also for increasing public authority through the same control of the church a bit like the Carolingians before by the same Ottonians that also um, uh, used this uh, uh, mean of invoking the regular clergy for the Libertas Ecclesia to control better from an imperial and not just a local lay standpoint the, the local church the Libertas Ecclesia is naturally the full liberty of the administration of, and of the authority of the church from the interference and the uh, claims of seigneurial superiority uh, by the lay powers with the end of you know, achieving the rigorous observance of the Benedictine rule in these places because of course the monasteries were very rich and they worked also as um, you know as any other fief like they had they had peasants they had retinues they participated in this political game so it's obvious that the same life within these monasteries was kind of much more worldly than what the Benedictine rule that as you know is quite Spartan um, also work focus um, focus uh, would, would actually look like and also because the people who inhabited these monasteries were the same noblemen right that um, you know from the families of the uh, that had founded the same monasteries and that controlled them as a sort of patrimonial asset rather than than anything and that they were considered as private but they were at this point especially all Benedictine, right? were not other rules in the West, right? If you were a monk, you were a Benedictine. And so the rule of Saint Benedict had to be uh, respected, obeyed. And indispensable foundation of the, you know, uh, basically unbelievable regeneration of a, of a 
strongly worldly clergy were properly the the basis of the Cluniac reform that also ended up to right, not changing radically the entire system but starting this process of you know um, of uh, correction let's say of improvement of the moral standards of the same church um, in many ways this was passing through the same public affirmation of imperial power which again is um, did the two auto or universal powers going in parallel in the process also this reform indicated in the roman pope the only banal legitimate authority of the ecclesiastical beneficium meaning that all of the church property were fundamentally to be controlled by the papacy uh, that is was the only one that could in fact, in, in a way, because at this point the papacy was not a monarchy yet, or a state, or anything, let's say, more concretely capable of controlling hierarchically the centers, but it had to maintain, because of the primacy of charity and just the, the overwhelming influence and spiritual power that Rome had gained in Western Europe, the, uh, uh, the, the one who would grant the ecclesiastical rights right the, the the rights of the clergy so the papacy was to direct this reform as well and everybody really thought this right it wasn't at the time like a like a clergyman who didn't think that the papacy had that power so that the papal monarchy Gregorian reforms were just the consequence just of a dramatic centralization of spiritual power of the papacy even before the proclamation of the Gregorian uh, dictat literally that affirmed its own spiritual superiority on, on any other actor, also a lay one. The politics of which was subjected to papal uh, to the papal regulation, and that's what we have seen before with the idea that uh, the, the Christian community was to be controlled by the church in in its in its practice uh, and corrected were things did not really work so in a sense this was already part of a juridical tradition of the papacy to claim that also the emperor of course had to be wary as always of the church right and in the west this was feasible right also in constantinople at some point the church tried to gain some autonomy there were brief times and you know it was brought under the emperor mm, straight away right or more or less so um um, and the Cluniac movement also looked mostly at the beneficia of the regular clergy, right? That uh, was, however, grafting on a broader reflection of the, the general, more general state of the church on the causes of the mundanization of the clergy, both the regular and the secular one. So both the monks and the bishops um, on the religiosity and the morality of the church right and on this heavy influence of the great lay lords in the life of the church that was under everybody's eyes and that was kind of um, let's say not much of a problem um, in, uh, in fact that it existed because of course all these monasteries and uh, you know the, the cathedral chapters and their the ecclesiastical administration needed the support of the lay authorities and vice versa right but because of this kind of blend between the two that at some point was literally undistinguishable right given the lifestyle the the general moral standards and so on um that were bent to very often to logics that didn't have to do with the standards set by the canons that were instead properly issued uh, by by the church of god so they couldn't really be ignored and so the situation at the end of the 10th century was characterized by uh, the politics adopted by the emperors of the saxon house otto the first otto the second and otto the third mostly there's also Henry II, then eventually there are the Franconians, and I think 
goes on there mostly with the Gregorian reforms, uh, who pretend to have the exclusive right of appointment of the title holders of the great ecclesiastical dignities. So um, a measure that had started as a form of protection because the emperors considered part of the imperial dominion the lands constituting the beneficia from which those dignities benefited, uh, which is the same problem that we were addressing before concerning the status of the papal states that were made up of these beneficia essentially as a earthly reality and that the church did not would not consider as actually part of the imperial dominion at a point, or even properly part of the empire, because those belonged to St. Peter, not to anyone else. Um, this situation, in a sense, was an exasperation of the same, and paradoxically so, of the same lay in interference in the papal affairs, as the Ottonians you know, elected many popes directly, etc., and they had always to contend power locally from the local aristocracies and as you know it was a pretty troubled um, government to say the least and it was very complicated to manage the situation Otto III even ruled from Rome but at some point he was obliged to, to leave because the city was not governable anymore uh, and as such um, the um, the the and the spiritual crisis lived by the papal authority in the process that was de facto uh, to uh, to be found like in from from, from one side uh, in controlled either by the emperor or by the, the Roman oligarchy from the other side right was uh, pretty complicated uh, also on a, again on this in, from the instances of the same reforms perspective. The intervention of Otto III in particular, that, as we've said, had established his court in Rome in 998, broke for a while the aristocratic monopoly of the papal office. It imposed in 999, um, on the throne of Peter, uh, um, the old imperial mentor, Gerbert of Rheims, Gerbert of Aurillac actually made a couple of videos about him. Uh, was one of the, the Pope Sylvester II, who was one of the the highest um, minds of the time. He properly conferred to the Roman Papacy to that universalistic ideology uh, and vision, and 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 with. Uh, that not even the empire at that point would maintain because the Ottonians, as you, you know, when in crisis were uh, civil wars and the same empire began to, you know, the, the Ottonian times was to speak in, in relative terms and began to withdraw again. And this uh, phase, um, again, is kind of an hybrid because from one side, the Ottonian interference started a new form of lay inter in interference on the church and in particular the imperial one in the life of the church but against this address the same church was kind of become and thanks to the same ideology and propaganda used by the Ottonians providing itself with this higher sense of purity that had not to be touched uh, by anyone lay and that would be at the base of the Gregorian reform itself, paradoxically. Um, and in the first half of the 11th century, uh, thus you see from within the same church, in fact, a reforming movement of wide breadth uh, taking place, indicating in the intervention of the lay authorities uh, uh, and in the choices of the great ecclesiastical dignities, starting from the papal one, the principal cause of the decadence of the spirituality and of morality of the clergy, and consequently uh, striving 
to eliminate all the customs that legitimize such interventions. Because these were customs, nothing more, and given especially that the church, again, could boast this juridical autonomy just by uh, traditionally, and that, that would have had probably nothing to do with these uh, lay interference, well, was a great advantage, a great base to start capitalizing on. And the instances of reformation were very strong, right? Uh, from from all the West, right? The uh, everybody was complaining about the imperial interference, and also was giving ever more power to Rome. So, this movement proposed itself to free, first of all, the papal election from any lay participation which was an old issue starting from the 9th century, but that was revived, especially again against the, during the Ottonians, that had revived the empire. And on April the 13th, 1059, the Pope Nicholas II had in the Lateran Council uh, a, a decree approving, approved, de uh, reserving uh, uh, the, the active electorate for the pontificate to the Cardinal College, which was composed by the bishops and the dioceses around Rome and by the presbyters of the great basilicas of the urbs. Uh, so, uh, pr the, basically taking them away from the um, the, the Roman people and clergy that had been title holder up of the same up to that point interestingly enough as well so also detaching itself from the more properly local um, local forces whichever they were right and this was quite crucial because it was strengthening papal hierarchy it was still very much connected to the Roman nobility right but it was still becoming a more compact autonomous uh, if not the fact independent system um, and the reforming movement by the way had um, say wanted affirmed the Roman papacy as the uh, top authority in the church this was wanted so the Gregorian reforms weren't uh, really just again wanted by I don't know a bunch of people in in, in the, the papal uh, in the papal entourage at the moment, right? Western Europe wanted this to happen uh, in ways that, of course, were also unpredictable and were kind of but just a general idea in ideology that would have had to free the, the church from any lay interference, etc. Uh, this, this aspect, right, properly being free from any form of subordination towards any other authority, spiritual or temporal alike right uh, so the papacy as a exclusive dominus of the ecclesiastical beneficium again that so the the ones that would entail the investitors hence the investitor struggle that was were mostly again normally controlled by the lay lords or at least uh, also the ecclesiastical ones were quite powerful on their own but there would always be this kind of blend and as uh, we explained also in the video about the Council of Sutra, it was never the possibility of fully realizing this division because the entire um, Western Church, uh, European world, was deeply intertwined, right? Uh, lay in a lay and ecclesiastical sense, right? Was, um, but um, this was factually aiming at the reinforcement of the same church uh, from a political standpoint, right? And just a spiritual one. That's also how and why the Roman Church uh, could enjoy so much power. It was wanted like that. This is yet another perspective that has been removed, historically speaking, from our attention, right? Because of the of the Protestantism, because of anti-clericalism, because of again of any stripping of spiritual interests in our world, uh, especially after the same, also Protestant countries kind of gave out gave ground to atheism and center so with any without any interest for how this historically happened and, and by the way I would like to stress that 
there are all sense of of ink written about like it's this is not a mystery or a strange topic that nobody knows um if people don't watch this stuff on youtube it's just because they're ignorant but it's a massive macroscopic cardinal historical topic in all medievistics and beyond right so um you should know these things and uh so also the average person is that nothing um and all this would naturally bring to the contestation of the demands of the lay lords starting from the same emperors on those very benefit. And so the papacy again was perceived as a new lord, as a guarantee for the observance of the canon rules over the ecclesiastical elections and thus in the first respect of the libertas ecclesia and the principal interpreter of such reforming movement was Ildebrand of Soana, as we know, elected Pope in 1073 with the name of Gregory VII, and from him the um, reforming movement takes the name as the Gregorian reform, or better, reforms, because first of all, after Gregory's death, nobody really thought that the thing would have gone on the way it would, right? But there were in fact other popes that stimulated this and, and and made most of the work actually, even compared to Gregory. But Gregory was the one who started, and as we will see now, also famously enough with the Dictatus Pap. So the canon collections of the 11th century as are consequently, as you as you can expect, expression of deep struggle lived by the church at this point. There were tragic moments where wars fought because of this. Right? So, uh, yet not touched by the reforming ideas, for example, uh, look the Decretum and the collect, uh, Collectarium Canonum of Burkhardt, Bishop of Worms, uh, who drafted them in uh, between uh, 1008 and 1012. And this work spread mostly in Germany and Italy because these were the most important kingdoms uh, in the, uh, in the ho of the Holy Roman Empire. And it was important because it collected uh, a much wider material than the one of the uh, previous canon collection, right, which witnesses also this renewed uh, historical, literary, philological, ecclesiological interest, historical interest for, for the law of the church, right? And that had to present with another, you know, with an improved version of this knowledge. And also because it's, uh, it's also dramatically systematized and orderly. Uh, it was drafted in 20 books that facilitated the consultation of the saint, and there is also another work, the Collectium, Duodecima Partium, composed in Germany between 1020 and 1050 that reunited an, ever, uh, an even greater material than Burkhardt's decree, but that it had a much less circulation compared to it, but still witnessing that uh, exactly in this ratio it was very often also great interest from a local level in this kind of, uh, of of collections and that it was needed for practical purposes. And the, the fundamental principles of the reform were eventually um, enunciated by Gregory the Seventh in the work of it's the list actually of uh, just 27 proposition of the Dictatus Pap in which are defined the prerogatives of the Church of Rome and of the Pope that constitutes a sort of uh, new order manifesto, right? And uh, and very much so because it worked. Uh, let's say not much in the immediate application of these ideas or ever, but still in the affirmation of, of a power that basically placed itself uh, above any other on earth in the name of God. And of his vicary on earth and this is interesting because it, it touched properly a, a greater 
issue regarding the the prerogatives of the lay power also in a sa in a sacral sense at the time these are the same years of the first crusade of this papal you know concrete power manifested also often at the expenses of other you know of, of the lay ones that were in crisis for many other reasons because they were also developing in their own way and um, and to the reformed ideas were inspired some collections naturally of the second half of the 11th century such as the capitulary of the Cardinal Atto of Vercelli that was composed between 1061 and 1073 and the Collectio Canonum of Anselm of Lucca, uh, the Liber Canonum of the Cardinal Deustedit, drafted in 1187, um, the Liber De Vita Christiana by bon Bonizzo of Sutri, and between, so we, we see also kind of a, an important uh, Italianization of these sources because much also of the Gregorian background was about providing with Rome and central Italy in this, in fact, was, was merging as the papal states, but also not just there, but as Italy with prerogatives that were separated from the one of Germany as the conquered date of Worms, as you know, would establish this, the Alpine um, divide, let's say the one between the kingdom of Germany and the one of Italy as the uh, respective field of uh, legitimate investiture by uh, the, in fact the, the papacy and the emperor um, and there is also the, in parallel of course the, the revival of Roman law from a civil side of the story here we're not looking at it but the emperor for essentially doing that instead and interestingly enough this was initially done also by by the clergy before the first European universities came about namely Bologna that was specializing in fact in the Roman law revival and between the end of the 11th and the beginning of the, of the 12th that so eventually the, the, the first great the definitive say victory in terms of you know the the success of the reforms right, of the papacy um, belong also other works that were at this point also reflecting the uh, the international impact of such struggle of course uh, the papal reform was not just a holy roman imperial problem for example, uh, the work of Yves, Bishop of Chartres, between 1090 and 1115, the Decretum Panormia and Tripartita, and the Polycarpus, that was a, a, a work drafted by the Cardinal Gregory of St. Chrysogonus between 1109 and 1111, the Liber de Misericordia et Justitia by Alger of Liege, dating to the years 1093, 1121, right? So these are all before, essentially, final settlement of Worms. And probably, uh, dating to 1106, uh, the, um, the, the, the Collectio Britannica, uh, that we also talk about maybe in another, on another occasion. So you see in this broader picture how these same uh, ecclesiastical canon collections were connected to the same development of European civilization following the same steps right the same expansional phases the same uh, broader dynamics that were affecting the cr Christendom altogether not just um, spiritually but unavoidably uh, you know temporally in that world and this again is obviously to be followed to be understood just when you know studying also the uh, by laws of reciprocity in almost uh, a Clausewitzian fashion that given that this was a war in some way um, the um, from the imperial side right, sort of looking at the 
the the story also from the recovery of, of secular law which was particularly um, prodigious as well for work of the time and development uh, for, for the historical philological civilizational work the development of juridical sciences and much much more right and uh, I can't stress this enough naturally I know that this video is will about ecclesiastical stuff won't even be clicked on because again it, talking about these things is you know what do people care people care about just uh, ethnic topics about the migration era there is nothing they care about except that so basically any other form of uh, you know important you know any other topic of m also much greater civilizational impact etc um, is actually not um, it's not really considered then you wonder why today's world is the one that it is well of course because for most people even talking about the history of the church is you know either making Christian propaganda or I don't know touching some broader issue um, uh, ideo you know some ideological issue etc and not really getting to a point where you actually can understand or improve systematically your view of the world but if you don't study these things how can you say today we talk so much also about you know western identity etc like if you don't study these topics like how can you understand what happened in your world this is not like a a, a tiny isolated thing I don't know there's a count who died in the 11th century and you know had no major political or military roles you can't say well I don't care even though you should still by some degree these things are much bigger Th these things are like what defined eventually the West for the centuries to come in all the relations between the the Emperor the church again if you don't understand the po the, the let's say the power actually that the church owned right what the popes really did in order to be so powerful and why where, where did their power stem from it's obvious that you just look at you know you you, you will you will f fill the gap with some kind of conspiracy theory you will start having hatred and misunderstanding because it's in many ways what brought to the end of the universalism itself not understanding uh, not trusting authority, by the way. Not not understanding at least the idea why, where authority exists. Where right? you may not trust authority legitimately, but let's say understanding it's at least why it is there, right? And why it formed historically, um, with a meaning, with a purpose, with a function, with somebody giving them power. Because otherwise, power does not exist if somebody doesn't give it to others. Right, and again, this is not a conspiratorial theory saying, ah, you know, there's evil power because they're, we live in a bunch of brain dead people, masses. Like, it's just power is to be given in the sense that it has to be produced. Right, if you don't have people who are capable of giving power because they're too ignorant and stupid, you will have weaker institutions at the same time. That's the reason why we have also such issues today. Right, and so then we can't complain. People will complain and say, "Ah, oh, it's 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 again because of the of the authority, not because of them," and so destroying the authority for them, destroying themselves for it. Uh, the uh, broader topic, especially of the investiture controversy, is exactly about this: what kind of power do you want to rule in the world, and what kind of uh, debate you want to trigger in this? Because this was, you see, if you don't. Uh, study these topics in their entirety you will also banalize and simplify and and um, empty the, the meaning of, of, of the enormous struggle that was occurred right? it was not just about a single issue or another when people say ah these are stupid religious problems that now in the secular modern world we don't you know it's it's completely the other way around like today the reason why we have problems nowadays is because you refuse to acknowledge what these people did Right, these people didn't have what uh, they made you having now, right? And and vice versa, you don't have what they got to make you arrive to this point. 
so that you can have a lot but you don't know even how to use it right so um, never think that you can't go out there in the world without knowing the history of the church the real one because um, it's useless like it's better for you to not just study history just do something else um, be do something merely material don't don't concern yourself with the things that you can you know you just don't want to understand even though you should really for your own benefit but again if you want to remain low remain low at least don't complain however that you earn a few that you're not capable you have you don't have opportunity you have plenty of opportunities everywhere right but um, in any case for today I stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time